Time to start the class and we have locked the doors. <laughs> well, welcome. Uh, uh, this is a special event uh, in Alumni Weekend. And we get to hear our tribal elder and our college historian talk story. June 1970, Blue Jay Yearbook is dedicated to our speaker for this afternoon. The dedication says, and I quote, the ideal college professor is one who is an excellent scholar, a fine teacher, and a leader in student life and extracurricular activity. Perhaps the ideal professor never existed, but to get an idea of what he might be, we should all look at Bill Parrish. <laughs> Obviously, Bill's students loved him. He won, he won the uh, student vote for the first annual Parents Association Award for the most outstanding teacher. And obviously, his former students still love him, as witnessed by our turnout today and every time that Bill is on campus. As you know, Dr. Bill Parrish came to Westminster College 60 years ago this fall, in 1955, at the age of 24, the youngest student to receive his doctoral degree in history at the University of Missouri. He advanced rapidly through the academic ranks from assistant professor to associate professor, and in 19. 63 as a full professor. He served as chair of the history department for two intervals and was the dean of the college from 1973 to 1975. He left us to join the faculty at Mississippi State University in 1978, where he was the chair of the history department and retired from teaching, teaching in the classroom, if you will, in 1996. He continues to be our very best teacher. Bill was the commencement speaker in 2001, was awarded an honorary degree. In the summer of 2009, Jane and I, and many others in this room, had a great time with Bill and Helen Sue, spending a week uh, doing Civil War battlefields along the Mississippi River. Again, the opportunity to meet with our great history class. Today, Bill returns to the role for which he is best known, the college historian role he assumed in 1965, 50 years ago. His book, Westminster College and Informal History, 1851-1999, is considered the ultimate source for all information about Westminster. This afternoon, he is going to share a little of this history with all of us in his talk entitled, Reminiscences and Perspectives. Please join me. Warm Westminster College welcome to our historian, Dr. Bill Parrish. Thank you. Thank you. the out I was supposed to turn on a button on here somewhere. If I can find the button, I'll turn it on. It's on. Oh, well, good. I didn't think I really needed it, but uh, anyway, it's on. Good. Anyway, I did establish a rule which was recommended to me by 
one of my professors at Mizzou. And this was again because I didn't want anybody to miss out on anything. Uh, there would be no sleeping in my class. <laughs> and if I saw you starting to nod, I would start one, two, and you better find a friend with a sharp elbow by four, I got to three, or you would go and depart and miss out on everything and have to come see me before the next class. I use that here, I used it at Mississippi State, and I'm very happy to say that I only had to use it once in the whole 45 or 50 years, whatever it was, I don't count time anymore, uh, that I was teaching. Uh, I did have one fellow who bombed out on me, which somewhat tragically. I was in the last five minutes of the last lecture of this particular semester. I think it was in one of the survey classes. He was on the front row, and all of a sudden, he collapsed. Well, it turned out he had a diabetic seizure, which was sad. And so we got to, that was the end of class. We got uh, help for him, and that was up in the old classroom on the second floor of Westminster Hall. As they were carrying him down those steps, and you will recall they were stone steps. I don't know whether they still are or not, but I guess they are, even though we remodeled it. Uh, they almost dropped him. I know my breath uh, almost went out of me, but fortunately they got him downstairs and got him to where he needed to go. As Barney said, I arrived here 60 years ago this fall. I was uh, starting to, uh, well, that sort of hit me this spring as I was thinking about what I was going to talk about. Gail Fuller and I came at the same time. Gail's up there on the top row. We were the first hires of Larry Davidson, who had just assumed the presidency the previous uh, spring. They brought him all the way out from Temple to take on this place out here. At the point, we had uh, 367 students, and of course, as you know, we were all male. Uh, they didn't believe in boys and girls going to school together yet, at least at the college level, uh, so, but uh, we got rid of that pretty quickly. Uh, my office was a closet at the back of my classroom that I shared with uh, Russ Jones. Fortunately, I had the desk next to the window, and I made sure that for the rest of my career, I always had a desk next to the window. When I graduated from that little closet up there, I went down and inherited Esther Randolph's little cupboard of an office on the first floor, and that was very nice and cozy. It was room for only me and one student, so you couldn't gang up on me. But it had a window. And uh, when I went to Mississippi State, I ended up with windows. And you know, a window is important. That way you can sit at your desk, put your feet up on it, and look out there and do your serious thinking. And, and I've always found that to be, to be very important. Uh, it was a little difficult in Esther's old office to turn around and do that, but at least I had the window and the sun was coming in part of the time. Uh, when I became dean, what did they do with me? They shoved me over into the old biology building because we decided that we were going to renovate Westminster Hall that particular year. And so I got a, a cubby hole. I don't know whether it was Dr. Day's old office or where it was, but anyway, I had an office over there. And we, we were well, well situated. The whole administration was over there. And, and uh, that lasted for about a year, year and a half. And then I finally uh, got an office uh, back in Westminster Hall uh, for one semester. And uh, then, uh, what, what was his name? Oh, um, Dale? Uh, something, yeah, Dale Purcell. He and I had a disagreement, and so I went up and I got John Randolph's old office on the second floor, which was the biggest office I ever had. 
And, uh, but I had, again, I think I had two windows in that one. <laughs> anyway, um, when I got here in 1955, all we had were the buildings on the hill. That was the college. You started with the old Hall of Science down here. You came up to Dr. Day's, and that had been built in 1902. You came up to Dr. Day's shack, which was a World War II building that he made the most of, bless his heart, all the years that he was in it after the war. He had started off in the Hall of Science, and he outgrew it. Then you came around in Westminster Hall, next to the gymnasium, next to Washington West House, then to Reunion Hall, where at that point uh, the old Highlanders and the Sigma Chi's were sharing it as a dormitory, and then on down to Reeves Library, which just fairly recently been completed. And across the street was what was left of Swope Chapel. Uh, Swope Chapel had been built right after World War I as a memorial, and uh, whoever was the planner didn't anticipate that it was built on a hillside and that after so many years of Missouri clay, it started to slip a little bit at a time. And just before I got here, just before Larry Davidson got here, his first big problem was to deal with having to dismantle at least half of Swope Chapel. Uh, we left the other half, and as some of you will remember, we met there two days a week for services, uh, one religious and one non-religious. And unfortunately, the faculty, particularly the junior faculty, had to sit there with you and take roll to make sure you showed up. And you tried everything you could to get out of it. I remember on one occasion, you went in the night before and tied Limburger cheese to the registers. Uh, there were these wall registers. And uh, on another occasion, you worked so hard, you took, they had theater seats, like, uh, not like these, they were the kind that raised up. You went in there uh, and took out all of the bottoms one night, and it took you much longer to do that than it did to sit there for 40 minutes and listen to somebody <laughs> preach at you. But, um, you know, you were full. And before I got here, I understand on one occasion, uh, they put a duck up behind the organ and timed it so that it would fall down just exactly when, when the minister started his talk. Oh, I tell you, we were ingenious back in those days. But in the basement of Swope Hall was the bookstore and the coffee shop. And on the days when we didn't have chapel or convocation, that was a nice break in the middle of the morning. We could go over there and get a cup of coffee and, and relax with Prof. Larson, who ran the place, and uh, then head back to, uh, to our classes. You know, some of you who were here back then will recall that we had classes six days a week. And uh, I was very fortunate to have classes at 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock on Saturday morning. <laughs> After you all had partied all night <laughs> down on the road. And my rule about sleeping came in very handy on, on those occasions. Uh, we also had what was called negative credit hours. You were allowed three absences per semester, whatever the cause. Now, if you got seriously ill, that was something else. But if you were gone more than that, you were deducted one credit hour for the course for each absence. And it was double on holiday weekends. <laughs> we wanted to keep you here. I'm not sure why, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, everybody was required to have a Saturday class. The afternoons were re reserved for the labs, Dr. Day and, and Dr. McCright and, and, uh, and so on. Uh, that situation continued, uh, although it, it, it diminished a little bit 
in terms of how many times we had to go to chapel. But that continued until we got uh, Champ Auditorium uh, in 1967. And at that point, uh, the bookstore and the coffee shop moved over to the basement of, of Champ, and everything else went upstairs. Um, one thing that, another thing that occurred as a result of the demise of Swope Chapel was that we had to have commencement out exercises outdoors. And uh, because the chapel was no longer big enough, you, you'd go down to the Presbyterian Church for baccalaureate, but out, outside. And I must say, in the 10 years we did that, we never had any of the stuff that we've had off and on today. We were very, very fortunate. And the last class that had an outdoor commencement was the class we honored this morning from 1965. And I think we did, did real, really well, all things considered. And then, of course, everything moved to Champ. Uh, one of the things that really meant a lot to me, and I think has meant a lot to this college over the years, in fact, I've talked about this any number of times, I don't want to go over my limit, because uh, I know Barney's got to get out of here. I don't care about the rest of you. Uh, uh, <laughs> if I get carried away, you can, as I said, the door is always unlocked. Um, we had a great faculty back in those days. This college has always had a great faculty, a very dedicated faculty. and. Many of them have stayed for years. I stayed for 23, and a lot of my colleagues stayed much longer than that. Of course, the premier professor was Dr. Day, a wonderful, wonderful man. He'd been here since the late 1920s, and he had built one of the most outstanding pre-medical programs anybody ever knew about. If you weren't prepared to go to medical school when you finished with Dr. Day, well, he would have weeded you out at the end of your sophomore year, and that just didn't happen anyway. Uh, but he was, he was a great man. He was a good friend of mine. Uh, I got a lot of his uh, weed outs at the end of the sophomore year. They came over and turned into history majors and turned out to be pretty good people. But. Um, the dean of the college had just uh, was Dean Dahl, Leif Dahl. He had been here since 1930 as professor of uh, French Romance languages, and he just assumed the deanship uh, with Larry Davidson at the same time that Larry became became president. We also had Don Gordon teaching French. Don's grandfather or great grandfather, I've lost track which, had been a president of the college in the late 19th century. Don had been here, it was a graduate, and Don had been here a long time. In Spanish, we had uh, Yanaro Artiles, who had retired from the Spanish diplomatic corps because of a man by the name of Franco, who came in and took over Spain in the 19, uh, late 1930s, and he, he emigrated over here by way of Cuba. We also had Steve Vargas, two, two excellent people. Artiles was also the librarian and, and did, did service there. I've talked about him and his, his wife and watching the boxing matches with them on another occasion. I won't go into that. Uh, in the classics, we had Robert Herber, a great man, uh, very dedicated to the Lutheran Church. He taught the classics, not only the classic languages, but he also taught Roman and Greek civilization. And, uh, had a wonderful reputation. His son later came back and taught in the economics uh, department. And then uh, one of the greatest strengths of this college at the time I arrived was the English department. Three gentlemen, one had been here for quite a while, and he stands out all by himself. There's a little memorial to him where the biology building used to stand. That's John Randolph, one of my
closest friends, he and his wife Esther, used to go over to their house on Saturday night and he had a player piano and we'd stand around that player piano and sing till we became hoarse. But uh, recently arrived on the scene, a year or two before I did, uh, was Bill Blyfus, another great teacher. And then there was that son of South Carolina with that long drawl, but he's a wonderful guy, Leon Wilkerson. And the three of them uh, made up, I think, one of the finest English departments that any small college ever had. And uh, they, they dominated. My colleague Russ Jones, of course, in history, and when I came, Jones was part-time history and part-time political science. Thank goodness I didn't have to do that, but I, I could have if I had to, but I didn't have to. Uh, so we were a one and a half person department. Uh, the head of the political science department was Dave Horton, who was another outstanding individual. He left here in 1965 to go down to the University of South Alabama and establish the political science department down there. Uh, he uh, went uh, at the invitation of a fellow from William Woods who had gone down there as the opening chancellor for that campus when it was established. I was invited to go with them and, and see what I could do about a history department, and for various reasons I did, I did not decide to take up that offer. But uh, others came in his stead. Two of them I particularly remember. Some, some of you will too. Peter Kim, a longtime friend of mine, and uh, then who could ever forget Ernie Mittler if you ever met him? Uh, enough said about that. Uh, <laughs> He, he was the epitome of somebody we had earlier who taught German uh, by the name of Felix Scharten. And I, I won't go any further with that one because Felix and I disagreed on practically everything. Uh, in economics, we had uh, Prof. Larson and Carl Ellis, uh, and later John Bosch, uh, uh, whose son was in the 50-year class this morning. Uh, came and, and uh, taught uh, in, in that department. As I said, Gail Fuller came with me in 1955, and uh, over the years we added others, two in particular I would mention, Audrey Remley and uh, uh, Lynn Mueller. They, that was a good, good, very good department. Well, a college is Oh, yes, excuse me, I, I need to mention one other area, and I don't know why I overlooked this, and that's chemistry, where my good friend Bob McCright was the head. He had come in and taken Dr. Weigel's place a couple of years earlier. Bob, again, was one of my closest friends. We went to all the MU football games together all through the years, and uh, uh, he was assisted uh, when I got here by a another character called Frank Olivier, whose wife was more of a character than he was. And, uh, but subsequently, uh, Charlie Brower and John Schultz uh, took over in the chemistry department and, and carried on uh, McCright's tradition. Uh, we also had Chester Alexander, who represented sociology, and his wife, who taught Russian. And, uh, then we had the ROTC, and we got a new colonel the same year I came, Colonel Lauren Johnson, and he stayed for three years and went on to retirement, and I kept up with him for, for quite a while. We had a new chaplain, uh, Ed Tradibus, uh, who only lasted uh, a year and went on to other things and was followed by a number of other uh, good people one of whom I remember particularly came in the 60s and stayed into the 70s, uh, and that was uh, my good friend Bill Huntley, who came as chaplain, ended up as dean of student life, and, and did all kinds of things, good things. You know, a good faculty, 
and I, I've said this on many occasions when I've been in administration, when I was dean, when I was department chair down in Mississippi State, a, a good leader is only as good as the secretary who keeps him going. And this college back in the days when I was here had a wonderful staff, three of whom I would mention in particular. The secretary to the president was Dorothy Canada, who held that job from 1942 to 1985. And uh, Dorothy always had a smile on her face uh, and uh, cheered you. Uh, Barney's got a good K now who takes that role and, and is the epitome of, of what Dorothy was back in those days. Another I would mention was Betty Weber, who was my secretary when I was dean. Betty occupied that job from 1935 to 1980. And over the years, she served eight deans in that office. And the third person I would mention is Sarah Wilson, who was the bursar, as we called her in those days, but also essentially the secretary to the business manager from 1935 to 1969, a, a wonderful woman in the business office. And she served under Herman Schuessler. Herman was a very interesting guy. He had been brought in in 1934 when the college was in very serious straits during the Depression. He'd been brought in from Harbison Walker and made the business manager of the college. And he stayed in that job until he retired in 1966 and then tragically died two months after he retired. Uh, but a wonderful guy. He was, uh, he had a long pipe that hung down like this with a bulldog expression on his face. And when you got behind that, he was a, a really nice guy to know, but uh, yeah, that tended to keep students like you away from, 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 from things. But, <coughs> excuse me. In the spring after I arrived, in the spring of 1956, there came back to Westminster a man who for the next 40 years would occupy every support position on this campus. He started off as an admissions counselor. He walked uh, through the Dean of Student Life office. Uh, he went back to head the admissions department. He became director of development at one point and even acting president on a couple of occasions. Another very close friend of mine, and we sorely miss him, and that's Jack Marshall. And I was so happy when uh, they dedicated the uh, thing this morning to Jack and, and made, made that a part of the program and, and also established a scholarship in his honor. Uh, I mentioned Bill Huntley. Uh, Dale Purcell, who followed Larry, uh, unfortunately made me his dean. And then unfortunately he and I disagreed on a number of things and I only lasted a couple of years, but that's all right. I enjoyed getting back to the classroom. Uh, Dale moved out a year after I went back into the classroom, and that, that's enough said. But Dale had two, uh, two achievements to his credit that I, that I will give him credit for. Uh, the first, and probably the most important, was he hired Pat Kirby as Dean of Student Life. And Pat has been going strong from one job to another ever since and is still here and he's become one of my best friends and we owe Pat a great debt of gratitude. One of the things that Pat has done in the last half decade or whatever, a decade, I don't know, I lose track, is to what shall we say, internationalize this campus with all of the international students he has brought in from all over the world. 
and what a difference it has made on this campus in all kinds of ways. Uh, a year after I came here, Westminster admitted its first African-American student. His name was Ernie Cooper. And Ernie was the valedictorian at Fulton High School. He was also, interestingly enough, the student body president, even though he'd only been there two years, because prior to the civil rights decision, the African-Americans had to go to school over at Lincoln. But uh, Ernie earned the scholarship because we always gave it to the valedictorian of the senior class. That was an automatic. And so Ernie came, and he was an outstanding student, pre-med student, one of Dr. Day's guys. Unfortunately, he did not have a very good career. It's interesting, in the last, oh, within the last three or four months, I had an email out of the blue from one of the members of the class of 1960 whom I had not heard from since he graduated. This happens fairly often with me. I hear from one of you out of the blue for something, you got a question about something, or you've got a manuscript you want me to look at, or, or whatever. But Lanny Larison of the class of 1960 emailed me and wanted to know what I could tell him about Ernie. Uh, Lanny was a Delt, and he worked in the kitchen as part of his earning his way through college, worked in the Delt kitchen with Ernie's mother, who was the cook at the Delt house back in those days. And he, he was asking about, about Ernie, and, and we went back and forth about that. And uh, Lanny and I kept up a correspondence, oh, for about uh, four or five weeks. He's up in Boston, and I learned all about... Uh, what was going on up there with the snow firsthand uh, from, from Lanny with all of, all of his uh, difficulties. Well, uh, the second thing that Dale did, which was of great significance, was that he made Sally Reynolds the career development officer of this college. And Sally filled that role magnificently until she stepped down and retired. And uh, many of the younger alums have a great deal of gratitude to Sally for the way she set up that program, brought in some of you to lecture uh, about your various careers and encourage you to think about uh, whether it was law or, or uh, medicine or whatever. When Dr. Day retired, it took three guys to replace him, Howard Hind, Warry Williams, and Doug Fickus, each about as different from the other as you could imagine in terms of their personalities, but each uh, wonderful guys. And then they expanded and put in botany and brought in uh, my good friend Ed McClary uh, to do that. Well, I've, I've wandered uh, all over the place, but one of Larry Davidson's achievements, almost as soon as he got here, within two years, in fact, was the expansion to the North Campus. Uh, the old McIntyre School, which stood down on the corner where the Churchill Memorial now is, uh, they built a new McIntyre School further west, and the college acquired uh, the old school. I taught in there uh, 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 for three or four years until they tore it down. Uh, but uh, Larry's dream was for all of the freshmen to have a common experience. When I got here, as some of you will remember, we had Rush over in the gym. You stayed there. As soon as rush was over, you went down to the fraternity house if you were fortunate enough to be pledged, and most of you were. And some who did not get a bid uh, either moved out in town, or I can remember on occasion a couple of them went home because of disappointment. Well, Larry wanted to end that system 
And so his dream was to build a freshman dormitory system and everyone would live in college housing the first year. And uh, in the 1950s, late 1950s, he accomplished that with Churchill Quadrangle. Uh, two dormitories were built, uh, Rice and Scott Hall, uh, and were ready for occupancy in 1958, along with Robertson Dining Hall. And I was still single at that point, and I was in need of housing. So I ended up as the proctor at Rice Hall, at a nice little apartment there, and uh, one of my responsibilities was to keep the independents in my hall away from crawling over the roof of Robertson Dining Hall to get at the Highlanders who became five size during that period over in, the, uh, over in Scott Hall, and really to keep them from coming over and, and, and to keep, keep the two groups separate. And that was an interesting experience, uh, uh, serving in that capacity with those guys. And some of them became really good, strong friends of mine and, and strong alumni. I even got the father of one of them on the board of trustees for, for a long time. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he did a magnificent job uh, from, uh, he was from down in Oklahoma. Uh, we, had a, we had one tragedy during that year in which one of our guys uh, took a gun to himself and uh, didn't, uh, and uh, over a broken romance, uh, and I was, uh, I was out of town over the weekend because, or, or for Saturday, because I was dating my first wife, and I got home and, and confronted that, and then all of us had to go up to St. Joe and serve as pallbearers at his funeral, which was a really tragic, tragic thing. But then in 1959, the other two were finished, and the Churchill Quad became a reality. And then also, uh, shortly thereafter, Weigel and Sweezy Halls were built across the street uh, for those who did not want to, uh, well, the five size occupied, uh, which one was it? Weigel. Weigel? Wetterow. Wetterow? Well, whichever one it was, they occupied it. <laughs> and, uh, and then the other was the Independence. And, uh, <coughs> Then, when I talked a year ago, uh, I was talking about the presidents of the 20th century. And, uh, well, I, I, I've got a couple other things I've got to put in here before I talk about that. Of course, in 1967, we got Champ Auditorium, which opened with a concert by the Kansas City Philharmonic Orchestra. And what a difference that made on, on campus. And then, just across from it, going up very slowly, stone by stone, because they sent the wrong stones first, and we had to have a jigsaw puzzle out there, back of Champ Auditorium, till we got it all straightened out, of course, was the Churchill Memorial, which we dedicated in 1969 with Lord Mountbatten coming as the representative of the Queen. This was shortly before he was assassinated. Uh, General Mark Clark came as the representative of uh, President Nixon. Uh, we had uh, several of the Churchill members, uh, Churchill, one, a couple, one Churchill daughter and, and several grandchildren here for that occasion. Uh, it, it, it was a, a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. <coughs> And uh, we had the dedication out there uh, on Westminster Avenue on, on the, on the uh, what would it be, the, uh, the east side of, uh, of the building. That, of course, has been one of the very, it was, it's Larry Davidson's legacy, that whole start of the North Campus and the Churchill Memorial. And, uh, but, uh, that's about as far as I got last year. And the four presidents who came after Dale Purcell all made very significant contributions. Harvey Saunders, 
Jim Crer, Fletcher Lampkin, and of course Barney. And uh, what Fletch and Barney have accomplished uh, in the last 15 years is little short of a miracle uh, when you look at what's happened up on the North Campus and elsewhere. Uh, the Science Center, where we are, of course, got uh, its initial start during Larry's administration, and then Coulter came along and, 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 and endowed it and, and allowed the, the big expansion. Uh, that, that, uh, that took place in, uh, well, it took place sometime in, in the 1960s. Uh, let me say that we owe a debt of gratitude to the last four presidents of this institution. I only disagreed with Jim Trayer on one thing. Uh, when he got uh, the legacy which made it possible, among other things, he brought back football, and I thought it was a big mistake. We'd gotten rid of it in 1933 because of the Depression. The faculty said we can't afford it when our salaries are being cut. But it turned out to be a good thing. Lo and behold, they had a winning team almost from the beginning, had good players since, and they've done real well for themselves. Uh, basketball was the big sport when I was here. Uh, Gene Kimbrell was the coach. He'd been here since the 1920s. And uh, he put together one great last team in the late 1950s. And uh, one or two of them were supposed to show up this afternoon. Bob, are you up there somewhere? No? OK. Well, anyway, uh, they won the conference championship. And there was so much enthusiasm that we hired buses and went to out-of-town games. I remember going to Drury. I remember going up to William Jewell uh, and, and various places. And, and it was tremendous enthusiasm. And then uh, after that team, uh, well, shortly after that, Coach Kimbrell uh, retired. Uh, baseball, Harold Flynn was the coach for many years. And his greatest success in baseball was that he coached Bake McBride, who went on to the majors and had a great career uh, with the St. Louis Cardinals and later with the Phillies and was in the World Series with the Phillies uh, when they had that great team. Uh, tennis, of course, Brooks Loss took care of tennis. And then we had track, and we had two good coaches, Ray Keneal, who unfortunately passed away with cancer, and then we replaced him with Dick Alt. And Dick, again, was an, one of my closest friends. He served as dean of students while I was dean of the college, and we worked very closely together. And uh, uh, some of his students uh, befriended him with a scholarship, even as some of you befriended me with a scholarship, which I've been deeply appreciative of uh, back around 19, uh, no, no, not, not 1900, 2000. <laughs> I don't go back quite to 1900. I, I, I go close, but I, I, I don't get quite there. Uh, now we're ready for another transition in the history of the college. Barney and Jane, who have done such a wonderful job, uh, Barney came uh, as Fletcher's uh, vice president for academic affairs and then went up to the president's office when Fletch left. He and Jane are getting ready to retire to South Carolina. We wish them well. It's been a great 15 years with Fletch and Barney, and a lot has been accomplished. Uh, Miller Hall being one of the, one of the greatest accomplishments of, of that, that, that time, and a lot of others, all you've got to do is look around you. Uh, we wish you well, Barney. We thank you for all that you have done. And we look forward to the next round with whoever comes to lead us. But let me say this. This is 
and will continue to be a great small college, as Dog Lampkin did it. And if we all work together, we'll make sure that it continues to be just that. Thank you all very much for your patience. so appreciated you coming back uh, for alumni weekend year after year to share your wealth of historical information and your insights about this great small college with us. So we wanted to give you something a little special. Oh gosh. We consulted with the person who knows you best. <laughs> oh Ellen, boy, watch out. Ellen Sue. <laughs> and she told us that you would enjoy this gift more than anything else. And therefore it is my privilege to present it to you right now. This is a certificate which reads, in appreciation for your significant contribution to the success of Alumni Weekend 2015 and your continued commitment to the college, Westminster College has made a contribution to the Dr. William E. Parrish Academic Scholarship Fund in your name as a token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you, Barney. Hold it up, Bill. Oh, okay. okay. Bill, we also have a picture taken uh, at the President's Dinner with all your guys. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Get a picture of all three. Okay. Thank there you. we go. Okay. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank this you. means a great deal to me. Uh, when about 65 of you established that scholarship back around 2000, uh, one of the guys who was sort of leading the movement we were teaching out in Colorado, and uh, he called and said, would you like a chair? I said, I don't want a chair. I don't know. To, uh, well, he meant a, a chair, endowed chair. I said, what, what, what good does it, I mean, other than the guy who holds it, or the gal who holds it, uh, what, what good does it do? Uh, he said, well, what about a scholarship? I said, amen. That's going to help some kid come here and get the benefit of of, 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 of this experience. So I really appreciate uh, those of you who contributed to that and continue to tri contribute to it because it means a great deal. I, I get to meet uh, the recipient every year when, when we come to a dinner in the, in the fall. The one this year is, is a wonderful girl, young lady from, from Rolla who wants to be a kindergarten teacher. And I said, well, hallelujah. My mother was a kindergarten teacher and you go out there and take her place. And uh, she's now an ambassador, and I met her yesterday at the dedication uh, for the um, bust of Dr. Robertson, uh, and we renewed our, our, our friendship. Uh, a year ago, the recipient, uh, and she's a member of the women's basketball team, and the women's basketball team here finished third in their conference and had the highest academic average of any women's basketball team in the entire country. Amen. And that's, and last year, <laughs> last year the uh, recipient was the catcher on the baseball team who was also an outstanding student. And uh, Barney took me to lunch uh, the other day and I got to meet the baseball coach and he said, Casey is still going strong behind the plate and they're heading into uh, a game, I think, this afternoon and a couple of other games uh, this week that uh, can make the difference uh, uh, between uh, how far they go and what is their, their equivalent of uh, going on to a regional. And, and that, that's, uh, that, that's great. And, uh, well, Charlie, you did show up. I was talking about how we used to have seminars over in the old grade school building across the street where the memorial is now. And Charlie back there was one of the students who put up with me in one of those seminars back then uh, over there. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you all. <laughs>